Good morning. I guess it's time. <laughs> it is time. Well, no, we have a half a minute, but that's okay. We'll go with that. And would you believe that we have, what, 34 days, 33 days till Christmas? Let's not bring up Christmas until Thanksgiving's over, Jane. Come well, on. Well, we're, we're not, we're, we're on Thanksgiving <laughs> week. Okay. Well, I just want to let you know how fast everything is going. And to keep in mind, we have so much to be thankful for. The pastor will now lead us in prayer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for all those who have gathered around this worship place the place where we lift up the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, whether we are by telephone, by computer, by um, whatever circumstances we may find ourselves, even for those who cannot connect electronically or virtually, but yet and still they are with us in thought and prayer for them. And for this time, we give you praise. We thank you for those who are traveling who are traveling for the first time in a long time. We pray for their safe travel, their safe celebration, and their safe return. We thank you, Lord God, that we have been surviving during this COVID season, although we've lost so many people, so many loved ones, and some family have been hit especially hard. But we thank you, Lord God, that you have provided some insight and guidance for us to be safer and healthier. And even as the numbers are increasing in our area, let us be reminded to go back to the basics of do, simply wearing a mask when we are in public places. We thank you, Lord God, for how you have delivered your servant Willie from pain and it has subsided and he can walk again. We thank you, Lord God, for his life, for his ministry as he is able, Lord God, to regain his strength and health. And we thank you, Lord God, for Willie and for Rick and for um, Kathy, who are still actively involved in the education system to educate our children. And we especially thank you, Lord God, for those who already given their time and expertise and service to the school system and yet have come to a place of retirement, but their seeds that they have planted in the minds of these young children will continue to prosper and bring forth fruit. We thank you, Lord God, for, um, for being able to celebrate with um, brothers and sisters this Thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord God, for Paul, for his recuperation in his heart surgery. We thank you, Lord God, for Margie, who has celebrated 12 years of recovery from her own surgery experience. We thank you, Lord God, for Mary Ann and all those who volunteer in the food distribution ministry. I thank you for their faithfulness, God. I thank you, Lord God, for Sally and her commitment to the Beltsville Cats, but not only Sally, but Sister Margie and all those in this ministry and this community that love these kitties. And Lord God, bless us in this coming season to be able to bring more resources to this ministry and the important work that they do. Give us crafty and witty ideas how to raise some funds to help them in their important work because it not only impacts us, it impacts the whole community. And Lord God, let us be very mindful that every little thing that we do to assist other people makes a difference. We thank you, Lord God, for John and his successful back surgery. God, we give you praise because the back is such a sensitive area. And we pray that he does not have to go any undergo any further surgeries, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for those who mourn the loss of their loved ones. Lord God, we thank you that Oliver has now passed over into the rainbow or over the rainbow bridge. I like that, over the Rainbow Bridge and resides in Kitty Heaven. We thank you, Lord God, that you have provided even a place where, uh, where um, animals can have a place in heaven. And someone even had a movie saying, all dogs go to heaven. But my Bible says, 
animals are in heaven because Jesus is coming back on a horse. So I know that if horses are in heaven, so all the animals must be. We thank you, Lord God, hallelujah, for how you are continuing to let us be able just to celebrate in every area of our lives. We thank you for um, coming over times of fret and distress and fear. We thank you, Lord God, for um, English's second language ministry. We thank you, Lord God, for increasing our ability to be present in the community. We thank you, Lord God, that we have people in the church who are willing to give a new leader an opportunity to give them a new experience. And Lord, we are all pointing the direction to Christ. And we pray for those who are in the congregations and pray for those who are in the pulpits. We pray for all those who are facing challenges um, which are brand new and sometimes, Lord God, takes a little longer for us to learn than others. We thank you for uh, uh, technical support, technical instruction, and especially technical patience with those <laughs> who assist us in every area of ministry. And we give you praise and thanks for these and many more and add more blessings. And as we celebrate birthdays and uh, anniversaries and special occasions this month, we will never neglect to celebrate and uplift the name of Jesus in the midst of them. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Um, Becky will now lead us in the Young, ch young People's Check-In. Okay, well, I see Levi. Hi, Levi. And I saw Binta's name. Hi, Binta. Is there anyone else here who's a young person that I can? Well, I, oh, yes, we're all young. We're all young at heart. Um, to, to, November is um, Native American Heritage Month. Does any, can anyone tell me who the Native Americans are? Do you know who they are? I don't. You don't? Okay. Binta, do you know? Well, the Native Americans are people whose ancestors lived in the United States before anyone else came from other parts of the world. And there are still a lot of people who have that heritage. And this is also American history, I mean, the American Indian Ministries Sunday. So I'm going to try something new. So I hope everyone's ready for an experiment. And this is every, anyone can join, do this if you have a phone that gets the internet. So I have a Kahoot that I'm going to share. Have you, um, Bita and Levi, have you heard of a Kahoot? Have you ever played Kahoot? No. No. Have you, Levi? Yes, I have. I okay. Cool. Okay, and if you can't play on the phone, you can still play, you can put your answers in the chat. Okay, well, you know what? You always have a plan B, right? So I am going to ask you the questions. You just won't be able to see them on the screen or play on your phone, but that's okay. And let me find my Kahoot. I'm flustered, so I'm not thinking clearly. Okay, let me go over here. Okay, so I can't see you, but you can put your answers in the um, chat or you can yell out the answers since I can't see you. So here is my, are my questions. Hmm. Okay, so how many native, and there's, it's multiple choice. So you can pick an answer, put it in the chat or answer. Um, how many Native American tribes currently live in the United States or are there in the United States? Are there 50? Are there 235? Are there 574? Or are there, are there over 700 groups of Native Americans? Any? No. 
How many are you guessing? Hey, how many? I stand for. Hey, I'm four. Say it louder. It's, it's, it's 574. 534. Okay. Or 574. Okay. Any other answers? Let me look in the chat. Oh, okay. You guys are right. There are 574 different groups of Native Americans that live in the United States. Um, and they and, and even though we like we call them Native Americans, they like to be called by Choctaw or Cheyenne or whatever the name of their group is. Um, okay, so that is question number one. Let me go back to my questions. Okay, question number two. Which of these animals names come from Native American languages? Opossum skunk, coyote, or all of the above? Um, what do you think? All of the I above. See, I see some people guessing coyote. All the above. Nobody guessed all of the above. Very good. There are even more. When, when people came from other countries, other parts of the world, they had never seen those animals before. So they got the names from Native Americans. So there are no skunks in other parts of the world. They all live in North America, maybe South America. Very good. Oh yeah, Binta was right. Skunk is one of them. Skunk and opossum are actually Algonquin words. Um, and opossum is a Virginia Algon uh, Algonquin word. So it's from nearby in this area. Okay, question number three. I'm sorry, I'm being pokey here. Question number three. How many of our 50 states in the United States have names that are in Native American languages that we get from Native American languages? Is it all 50 states, 26 states, seven states, or no states? What do you think? How many of the, our United States names are Native Amer come from Native American languages? Levi says seven. Okay, that's a good guess. Any other guesses? Been to since 25 or 26, right? Okay. Um, yes, Binta is right. There are 26 of our United States have Native American names. Some examples are Ohio, which means good river, um, Alabama, which is actually from Choctaw language that means vegetable gatherers, which are farmers. So there were a lot of farmers in Alabama. Um, and Connecticut comes from an Algonquin word, which means beside the long tidal river. So, it's interesting to find out, and there's lots of um, other places too. Um, river, a lot of rivers have Native American names. Like nearby, we have the Patuxent and the Potomac. Those are Native American words. Okay, uh, let me go back to my quizzy quiz. Okay, I'm not. I'm going to skip that one since I kind of already gave you the answer. Let's see where it's. Okay, true or false? The food we call squash comes from a Narragansett word. Part of my, okay, sorry. That the original word was a scooter squash, which a Narragansett word from New England, which is where the pilgrims came and, and were eating squash. So do you think this is true or false? True. True, very good. Very good, you are right. And they actually called it elegant, um, the longer word, and then eventually we, they shortened it to squash. Okay, so let me go back to my quiz, sorry.
Ah, this one's kind of cool. The unit, this is also, well, actually this is, well, the, I found this out recently. The, uni, the University of Maryland has a new dining hall. It's the first new dining hall in 50 years. And it has a Piscataway name. The Piscataway Indians um, are from this area. Um, and the name is Yahentamitsi. So you can, I want you to guess what it means. Does it mean a place to exercise, a place to study, a place to go eat, or a place to rest? It's a, di a dining hall. So what do you think um, Yahentamitsi means? Let me go back to you. Okay. Any guesses? Very good. Okay, yes, it means a place to go and eat. And they're going to have some information on the Piscataway Indians in the dining hall. So um, that I think would be a cool place to go and visit when they have it built. It's supposed to be opened in 2022. Okay, so let me go back to my question. We're almost done, let's see. So that might be, that might be the last one. Yay. Okay, good answers. I hope you learned a few things about Native Americans. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about American um, Indian Ministries Sunday later in the service, okay? So I hope everyone has a good week and a great rest of November. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Becky. Thank you. And thank you for being patient with me. <laughs> You're not giving us a test, are you? There was a test. I mean, oh. it was it was a test to see who knew what, but oh. I couldn't get it to work. So that was a test on me, and I failed. Yay! No, you did I'll great. Have to, I'll have to experiment with somebody <laughs> to see how I can get it to work. Okay. Thank it you. was fun. Okay, we will now have our opening hymn, 577, God of Grace and God of Glory, verses 1 and 2. holy God, our heavenly parent. You are holy Jesus, our heavenly earthly brother. 
You are Holy Spirit of God in the church. As we worship you, consecrate us by your purifying spirit that we may become your holy children. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is John 18, verses 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief, chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king? For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify, to tell the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We will now have a Native American um, mission moment video. Tribal singers keep Native American traditions alive at the 150-year-old Wilbur Memorial United Methodist Church in White Swan, Washington. But elders worry that as time passes, cultural traditions will fade unless young Native Americans are prepared to lead. One of the ways your donations on Native American Ministry Sunday make a difference is to provide scholarships for Native Americans attending United Methodist seminaries and other schools approved by the University Senate of the United Methodist Church. St. Paul School of Theology's Oklahoma City campus is breaking new ground. Scholarship fund recipient Justine Smith is the first full-time Native American faculty member at the seminary. Smith says it's a sign of progress. Helps redefine um, how the church understands its relationship to Native ministries. In the past, um, there has been a, a missionized uh, relationship. Native peoples have been understood as being uh, mission to, uh, being in mission to, um, being the ones uh, who are being evangelized, um, rather than the ones leading mission. The Reverend David Wilson with the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference is a past scholarship recipient. Wilson says the program is long overdue and just makes sense for such a time as this. We've always known that Oklahoma has a great opportunity because we're, we're uh, second in terms of the Native American population across the country. If you bring Native students to your campus, you have to have Native faculty. Courses here will train Native Americans for leadership roles in the church and community and help educate others to become advocates in affirming the rich traditions of Native people and the changing needs of Native congregations. Being able to uh, recruit and bring up uh, Native leadership for churches becomes empowering for communities to see that they um, can lead their own churches. The curriculum was designed with input from Native Americans living in Oklahoma. It's very significant because it is the first time a Native American woman will hold a full-time faculty position in theological education. And for so many generations, we have done this kind of cultural violence where we silenced the Native Americans and imposed uh, Christianity upon them, and that we have a lot to to learn from them and they have to teach us now. Smith draws inspiration from her native congregation at First American United Methodist Church in Norman, Oklahoma. The Reverend Siobhan Cornell is pastor there and also an instructor in the school's contextual education program. 
Cornell says receiving scholarship funds from the Native American Ministry Sunday offering lifted his financial concerns and let him focus on becoming a more effective minister. Cornell clearly understands the hurdles young clergy face. One in four persons in Native communities live under the poverty threshold, which just automatically creates a challenging situation for many of our, our families, and that can even bridge over into our life in the church. And so what we see is we, we have to present a, a gospel message that will be empowering and uplifting, but also address some of the social uh, challenges that we face as a Native community. While developing the St. Paul curriculum, Smith is also pursuing her doctoral degree from Harvard. Students at St. Paul give her high marks as a professor. She was just a great teacher. She really cared about our success in that class. I think we were all successful because of Justine and the way that she worked with us in that class. Smith has high hopes for future seminary students who will attend and help build pathways of understanding to Native congregations. If we can sort of rewrite, maybe not rewrite history, but maybe socially correct some of the mistakes we made. I think, uh, how they say in the Bible, uh, a metanoia, uh, a changed way of understanding um, ourselves and one another. Um, and I think sometimes uh, we get locked into categories of relating to one another that um, have unhealthy dynamics. And this allows in my opinion, to break free from that, those past dynamics and those past ways of relating to each other. And when that happens, that transforms the church. Your generous gifts on Native American Ministry Sunday will help develop and strengthen Native American ministries within conferences that have Native American ministries. Provide scholarships for Native Americans attending United Methodist Schools of Theology and other schools approved by the University Senate of the United Methodist Church. Expand the number of target cities in the Native American Urban Initiative. Learn more by visiting our website, www.umcgiving.org slash NAMS. As we prepare our offering, um, we, we will have, there's many ways that for givings. You can give online through our secure online giving form or scan this barcode that's on the screen. You can mail the check into our office. And um, when you do uh, make your offerings, please um, make a, um, there is a, under special donations, that's where you would put your offering for and just indicate Native American offering. Let us pray. God of majesty and power, you have dominion over all the universe, and yet you choose to rule not in power, but in love. The gifts we give to you are not given from fear or in petition for your favor, but in the deepest gratitude for all your blessings that keep us and sustain us. May our whole lives reflect to the world that there is one who rules us with love and compassion above all of this world, nations and principalities. In the name of your son, the Christ, we pray, amen. And that's John 18, 33 through 37. Um, Trudy will now lead us in our hymn of preparation, 626, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence.
let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you this day, bleeding the blood of Jesus over everyone assembled, that they may hear what the Spirit says to them. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today, in the church calendar, we celebrate what is termed the Reign of Christ Sunday, or another term that you may be familiar with is called Christ the King Sunday. And um, my uh, original message has changed um, over the course of the last couple of days because of what's been happening in the world, but it all seems to fit in to what God is saying to us through God's word. First, I want to begin with telling you a little bit about the significance of Christ the King Sunday or the reign of Christ Sunday, in that we as United Methodists and some other Christian denominations follow what is called a lectionary. A lectionary is the set readings for a given week that cover a period of three years. We have the years divided into A, B, and C. Today marks the last day of the lectionary calendar and we are currently in year B. So next Sunday, we will start a new lectionary year and we'll be in year C. Well, you may think, well, what does that got to do with anything? It has a lot to do with how we uh, study, how we uh, preach, how we pray, because the lectionary was adopted from the practice of the Jewish synagogue of keeping certain scriptures preached on certain Sabbaths. And when the rabbis or teachers would teach the people, they had typically something from the Psalms, something from the Torah, something from the prophets, and we likewise follow that pattern because we call it the Old Testament <laughs> readings and which is the, the Jewish uh, scriptures. And we also incorporate now as Christians what we call our New Testament texts. And we derive our structure of preaching and teaching from the lectionary calendar. And this being... Uh, Christ the King Sunday is somewhat significant historically because this particular Sunday was designated in 1925 um, by Pope Pius IX. And uh, we, like many other Christian uh, religious um, organizations, follow a structured way of preaching. And because during this particular time in history, the governments around the world, because it was at the end of World War II, many governments had collapsed. The uh, importance of focusing on that there's a government of God was emphasized, that there is a kingdom, there is a government, there is a structure that will not collapse and will not fail, and it is the government of God. So consequently, we have Christ the King Sunday or the reign of Christ Sunday. And this day I share with you uh, the scripture that um, is slated for this particular Sunday, which is John 18 verses 33 through 37. But I also remind us that in um, first Timothy, not, yes, 1 Timothy 4 and 13, 
there was a scripture that says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and teaching, meaning that as we await Jesus's return, we are still to devote ourselves to reading, to scripture, to preaching and to teaching, and consequently learning. So as our understanding evolve, evolves with the um, focus on John 18, we see, which has already been read for your hearing, the scripture from the New Revised Standard Version, then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? What's happening here is that the Sanhedrin, the, the high council of the Jewish um, establishment has brought Jesus to Pilate to put him on trial. Actually, the Sanhedrin have already put Jesus on trial themselves, but they don't have power to execute him. So they have handed Jesus off to Pilate with the hope and the intent that Pilate will convict Jesus and execute him. So he, so Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? In other, other words, uh, is this a charge you're bringing to me or is this something that you have been told? And um, so Pilate recognizes that um, something is amiss here because uh, he says, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? So Pilate is looking for some evidence for purposes of saying that Jesus is guilty of something. And Jesus answers him and says, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So Pilate asked him, so you are a king? <laughs> and Jesus says, you say that I am a king. For this, I was born. And for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. In this simple exchange, Pilate is recognizing and affirming and acknowledging that Jesus is the king. And I think his measure of relief comes when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, Pilate is thinking, okay, he's got a kingdom, but I don't have to worry about him trying to come in and take over where I'm in charge. So Pilate, while he's interested in what the Jews have to say, because this council is part of his political arm that has helped him to keep rule over the Jewish people. And Pilate is a Roman in this kingdom. He wants his kingdom to be intact. Yet his diplomacy and his connection with his Jewish Sanhedrin is going to allow him to still have clout with them. And as he is in conversation with Jesus, Jesus, remember, is also on trial. And even though in this particular passage of the scripture of John, we are not going as far as to see that Jesus ultimately is crucified, which we already know the end of the story because we've seen this movie before. But in his interrogation or his cross-examination of Jesus on the stand, he can find nothing really which satisfies the requirement to say that Jesus is guilty, therefore he must be put to death. So Jesus is on trial. Jesus is being assessed for his innocence and for his guilt according to the charge. And the charge is you are claiming to be king. Jesus himself is not making the claim but the Jews, the Jews lay the claim at the doorstep and at the feet of Jesus. And even if you know the story well, when Jesus is ultimately crucified, 
Pilate has written above his head in every known language of that day that Jesus is king. So the declaration and the coronation of Jesus is publicly displayed in the midst of the crucifixion, which is ironic in and of itself. And I bring this up particularly today because it's poignant because a couple of things are happening in our own society in terms of courtroom examination, courtroom outcomes, and courtroom uh, decisions. So uh, I want to mention two in particular. Uh, there was a young man named Kyle Rittenhouse who recently was put on trial for, um, for some uh, killings that went on in Kenosha, a little town called Kenosha. So when uh, most people would know what I'm talking about. 80% of the people that they hear Kyle Rittenhouse, if they hear Kenosha, if they hear um, Black Lives Matters, they would know what I'm talking about. But I just wanna generally set this to one side. People are either on one side of the issue or they are on another side of the issue in terms of how they thought the outcome of the case should have happened. And people are justified in feeling what they want to feel and how they want to feel because they have a right to have an opinion on the matter. But when we look at the American justice system, we find that it's not simply a matter of justice that really pans out. Just as we look at Jesus's situation, and it's not always a matter of justice that really pans out. It's a matter of courtroom procedures. It's a matter of politics. It's a matter of public opinion. And sometimes the groundswell of public opinion, sometimes the groundswell of passion influences people to go in one direction or the other. Now, there's another case that's been in the news that you may not have paid particular attention to. And, but I noted it, I noted it <laughs> because there was a man back in the 60s named Malcolm X. Some of you may know who he is. Some of you may know the name, but really don't know anything more about him. Malcolm X was assassinated. After Malcolm X was assassinated, there were two men who were convicted for the assassination of Malcolm X. And their names were Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Islam. And I'm saying this for your hearing. After all these years and all these decades, since 1965, when Malcolm was assassinated until this week in history. The investigation after both these men had been convicted for a crime has revealed these men really didn't do it. Not a lot of people are paying attention to that, but you should. Because I want to point back to the fact that the justice system is not always just. Just because someone is pronounced not guilty does not mean that the person didn't do it. Just because someone is pronounced guilty doesn't mean that the person did it because the pronouncement of guilt or innocence is not always in alignment with what the truth is. So when Jesus says, I came to testify to the truth, that's saying something, because in the end, Jesus knows that the truth will win out. Let us consider, Jesus was falsely accused. Jesus was politically persecuted. Jesus was wrongly convicted. And Jesus was publicly humiliated. And yet and still, he took upon him the humiliation, the suffering, not because he was guilty of committing any crime, but he went on the cross 
as the substitutionary work for us all. I want you to understand that at some point in each of our lives, we all deserve to be described as guilty of something, but Jesus in his kingdom, in his system of justice, in God's kingdom, in God's system of justice is prepared to take on the guilt of everyone who would confess their sin and give their lives over to Christ because Christ has paid the penalty for you that you do not have to the suffer the consequences in the kingdom that is to come. All those whose sins are confessed and are forgiven are proclaimed not guilty. Why? Because you are covered by the blood of Jesus. It's as if I had uh, a list of my sins, correct? And I have all my sins listed. I don't know if you can see it, all my sins listed on this piece of paper. But when the blood of Jesus covers it, guess what? When it's covered by the blood, there's nothing to be seen. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? In God's kingdom, in Christ's reign, it does not matter what you've done, to whom you've done it, how long ago it happened, how recently it's happened, if it's still going on. But if you are willing to confess your sin, acknowledge that you are a sinner, God is more than willing and more than able to forgive your sin and wipe your record clean. This is the gift of God. This is salvation. This is why Jesus went to the cross so that everyone who is guilty can be set free. Will you receive him as your Lord and Savior today? If you have not gone to him in prayer, if you have not gone to him in all sincerity, if you have not confessed your sins, Say this simple prayer after me, where you are. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you died on the cross to take away my sin. I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. Come into my heart, be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for saving me. If you believe what you just prayed, say amen. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now, I offer this opportunity to those who may not know Jesus and the pardoning of their sin, but accepted Christ today to come forward to affirm that you have received Christ. Also, I offer this opportunity for those who do not have a church home to be received into the fellowship of Emmanuel United Methodist Church. If you are looking for a church home, if you are looking for somewhere to learn and to be loved, this is the place for you. You may be a thousand miles away. You may be a thousand yards away, but Christ is near to you and the Holy Spirit lives in the believers at this church. Is there anyone who would receive 
Jesus Christ this day or enter into the fellowship of Emmanuel this day. Let your voices be known or you may even put it in the chat. Amen, amen, and amen. Let us then affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Receive this blessing as we now have the benediction. God calls us into the world to embody a realm that is not of this world. Go forth now in the name of the one who is and was and is to come. May God's grace and peace be with you. Amen. Trudy will now lead us in our um, response to benediction 2040, a awesome God. Mm -hmm.